severe thunderstorm is defined by the Bureau of Meteorology as one which produces hail with a diameter of 2 centimetres or more, or wind gusts of 90 kilometres or greater, or flash floods, or tornadoes, or any combination of these. On the 14th of November 1979, Port Broughton sustained damage from a line of ferocious storms that hit southeastern South Australia. Very strong winds and hail ruined solid brick houses, holiday shacks and caravans. Cars were pushed sideways along the road and pine trees of up to 30 metres tall were uprooted. 11 people were injured requiring hospital admission and 60 others required hospital treatment. While Port Broughton incurred the most damage, other areas were also affected. Destruction was felt from the mid-north to the northern Adelaide Plains. So what becomes of a small coastal town when struck with a severe thunderstorm of this magnitude? Um, yeah, to get thunderstorms in general you do need three basic um, ingredients. Uh, you need what we call a trigger and that's something that creates the initial uplift for you know, the vertical movement of air which develops you know, fairly tall clouds that eventually become cumulonimbus clouds and develop into thunderstorms. Um, and the trigger was definitely there from the report that I found. There were a series of low pressure troughs that moved across the state. There were low pressure systems developing on those troughs as they were moving. So that sort of clearly um, was the trigger for the event. You know, a low pressure trough uh, definitely is what can create uh, uplift. Um, it's a, a sharp sort of change in air mass and that leads to, you know, vertical movement. So that's what would have been the trigger for the event. Um, another ingredient you need is the moisture. I mentioned it was like a tropical environment, um, so there was definitely a lot of moisture around and you need the instability. The atmosphere was very unstable. We seen a storm rolling in out the back of the bus. I got off the bus, ran up to the house to find out you know, where Dad and Mum were and start to try to prepare for what was coming. Papa was on the tractor ploughing fire breaks down behind the big scrub and Hayden had to go down and pick him up when he got home from school. So he had to drive through the scrub, which would have been terrifying. I, I jumped in the old ute and took off down the track to, to find my way down to the scrub. Uh, I, could, I could see it was getting closer every, every second and it was going to hit pretty hard. Came over very dark and came up very windy and there, down to the west of our farm, it looked like a big funnel in the sky, as if things were swirling around. Uh, I got to the start of the scrub and there's a track weaving through and started making my way through the track and that's when it hit and there was just trees just dropping in front of me, just snapping in half and blowing over, dust and wind blowing and made my way through the scrub without getting hurt or any ute damage and and that's as far as I got. I got to the edge of the paddock and I couldn't see a thing. I just had to stop and I faced the car the other way. So the wind was blowing me behind and then waited until the storm had finished. And when he got down to Popper, he was crouched down behind the tractor wheel trying to get out of the wind. Yeah, he'd, he looked pretty messed up too with the wind and uh, he said the tractor was actually bouncing as, it, as the wind came through and he was hanging on for dear life. He was fearful he was going to be swept away with it. It was that strong, so. I was actually walking home from school and I couldn't get over how high the tide was. It, the water was nearly up to the sea wall. So I decided to walk down and have a look. And I almost got to the sea wall and the water, the sea, just rose up and then just came straight towards me. I would describe it like horizontal rain. Um, so I ran, I turned around and ran back up the hill and then I turned right to go to the baker shop because that was the closest thing, place that I knew would be open. And as I was running to the baker shop, I was jumping over stoby poles that had fallen in the wind and electric, electricity wires were buzzing and zapping all over the road because they were still live and I was jumping them and tiles were getting blown off the roofs and landing all around me and sheets of iron off of roofs. I finally made it to the baker shop where I stayed until the storm was finished. South of the main street there was really no damage or very little damage but north of the main street the shack area looked like a war zone. There was, you couldn't actually physically drive down through the shack area because there was so much debris from shacks that had just 
virtually exploded. And um, it was surreal. It was just the most surreal kind of feeling that your town that you'd known all of this time was in the state that it was in. And driving down the main street, the thing that struck me most significantly were, were the Norfolk Island Pines that had always been a great entrance to Port Broughton and they'd lost so many leaves that they didn't look like the Norfolk Island Pines and they looked like broken teeth because it was just this jagged line of Norfolks that had all been um, horizontal and the same height before that. And you felt like crying because your town just didn't look like your town. Came back into Broughton and then realised the full impact and what had actually happened to the golf club house, which was pretty obvious, and then the nine hole golf course, which was pretty well wrecked as well. Yeah, well the club room, the club house consisted of um, rectangular Besser brick building and the only windows were facing west which was where the, the storm came from. And as the shacks below it, between the clubhouse and the sea, as they disintegrated, the debris broke the windows on the western side. That let the, that let the wind in and off went the roof and out went the walls. So it was just completely gone and, and it would have gone in probably 30 seconds. A bit worried about where mum was going to be and whether she'd been hurt or injured and we got onto the road and there was just trees screwing all over the road everywhere, just flattened and we got close, you could see the house was a mess uh, and the big tree at the front was a big 80, 100 foot big pine tree that was just split in half and laying on the ground, uh, laying in the front yard actually and yeah, we got back to find mum was okay, uh, she was in the kitchen fairly distraught. And the kitchen, the roof, they think lifted up and down and all the rain came in there, the floor was all underwater. The header was parked out the back of the shed, that had been moved about 300 metres down the road and that had the roof of the house on it and the big old stone chimneys were gone and yeah, big trees out the side were flattened, the, all the old sheds were flattened. Yeah, the shearing shed, that was all demolished, big, um, they were all stone buildings, the uh, implement shed. The big 65, 70 foot stoby poles down the road, they were just snapped over like toothpicks on the ground. Ironstone buildings that had been there for probably nearly 100 years were just flat on the ground. The damage that was done in such a short time, it just happened. And suddenly, uh, half an hour later, the sun was shining. Um, you know, it was just a normal day again, apart from the damage. And then suddenly um, somebody said, oh, you're wanted down at the hall. They were, had called in the SES, the Red Cross, which I'm the leader of. People were coming uh, from everywhere to help out to, because there were so many homes had been demolished that the people had to be relocated. And so we had to start up an evacuation centre. I, th I think some of the particular personal things that happened, or things that didn't happen to a guy called Wayne Lehman and his wife Helen. They were supposed to be in Port Broughton that night. They were staying in a friend's caravan, and at the very last minute they couldn't go. When they came to the next day to look, that whole caravan had been totally smashed and, and blown into a, and wrapped around a, a tree. If they'd been there, they'd have been dead. A uh, farmer, Howard Firm, who lived in the area, and his neighbour's house was literally blown right into his property and smashed. And you think, wow, how can that happen? And, you know, a place like Port Broughton, you don't expect a wind like that. Yeah, I, I guess um, in South Australia we do get uh, severe weather and severe thunderstorms, but it's probably not as uh, common and, and frequent as, as what we see in uh, particularly some of the eastern states of Australia, uh, particularly the severe thunderstorm that occurred at Port Broughton was um, a, a very rare event uh, from the information that I found. Uh, it looked like it was a, uh, a very uh, intense thunderstorm um, and one that we see quite rarely um, in South Australia. 
it was the most incredible um, community spirit that you couldn't, if it hadn't have happened, you wouldn't have realised how close people um, could become and how much they cared about other their neighbours and other people who hadn't gone through the devastation that that they had. So it was really amazing. Afterwards, you think we were lucky. We were very, very lucky. Uh, there was talk at school that it was a bit of a storm brewing, but. To, to what extent we didn't know. We quite often had little storms come through, but nothing like this. It was virtually a mini tornado. So. Also the army had come in because it, it was just such total devastation. It was like a cyclone. Um, uh, it was a beautiful day to start with. You'd never thought that it was going to turn into such a tragic event. Those sheets uh, of iron had travelled across the bay over the shacks and wrapped themselves around the, the trees on the course. So, as we've said, how nobody was killed is just unbelievable, really. So there's no real history left here other than one car shed. The rest is gone because of the storm.